director of Glacier Q Medicine Alliance. And it's just really great to see everyone tonight, see some familiar faces who's returned from wintering elsewhere, uh, see some new faces in the crowd. And so it's just great to have you um, here tonight. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of the Glacier Tea Medicine Alliance, we are a grassroots conservation organization based here in East Glacier. And we're dedicated to the protection, stewardship, and shared enjoyment of the cultural and ecologically irreplaceable wildlands of the Badger Tea Medicine and its interconnected ecosystems. Most of our work is focuses on trying to influence uh, federal land management uh, to keep this area wild and connected. Uh, we also do work to conserve fish and wildlife and promote connectivity, as well as to raise public awareness and foster greater appreciation for both the amazing wildlands and the cultural dimensions of this uh, of these areas. Um, some of the things we have upcoming ways that you could get involved this this year, in addition to our speaker series, in two weeks we're having a community conversation uh, here at the hall with Marcus Strange of the Montana Wildlife Federation to talk about some of the significant policy issues uh, that came out of the last legislative session that are affecting state-managed species, as well as some of those um, issues that are ongoing and likely to be uh, forefront in the next legislative session. So if you're interested in state uh, management of fish and wildlife or um, otherwise, please feel free to come and join us um, in two weeks if you have that conversation. Uh, other things, some other things coming up this year that I'll just highlight real quickly. Um, um, we're having a number of walks this summer, again, as we do most years, and walk registration is now available. We have walks from June through September in the Badger. We have a walk this year um, with Mariah Gladstone up the Fire Grand Pass, and we're also going to do an exploration of the recommended uh, slippery bill puzzle recommended wilderness. So there are lots of different options there. We're, going to, we're also going to have a community meat poll this year, at, um, hosted out at Rising Wolf Ranch, the, the poll will be in the Badger itself uh, in August, and you can talk to Jordan about that, but love to have folks turn out for that, both to help with the poll and to learn more about how we can better find invasive species in this area. Are you going to supply tools? We will supply, yeah, equipment, and we have lunch, and um, uh, several speakers afterwards as well. So. Um, and that's August 6th, and then we have a couple spots on our trail stewardship project this summer, August, I think it's 18th to the 23rd. So if you're interested in going out and being part of an awesome crew volunteering for a week in the Badger, um, you can sign up online or talk to myself or Jordan after this as well. Lots more information on the back uh, table for things that are upcoming um, as well. And um, I want to introduce now our speaker for the evening, and that is Holly Holmes. Holly is a wildlife technician for Glacier National Park, and I'm really excited for tonight's talk. Um, I have a personal love of harlequin ducks ever since I was a river guy in Idaho and got to see some of the amazing uh, habitat where these uh, birds um, spend their summertime rearing their young. Um, and she's going to share with us their amazing migration back via our sea duck that spends most of the year over on the Pacific Coast. Um, at, and then comes inland to these uh, river and stream systems to breed. And it's pretty cool because there's not a lot of places where they come across the divide, to my knowledge, but the Badger Two Medicine for a long time has had at least one breeding pair of harlequin ducks um, on North Fork Badger Creek and perhaps elsewhere, but at least one that we knew for the last survey that was still hanging out there. So I won't steal her thunder too much. We're super excited to have her. Uh, she's a graduate of Colorado State University. And we'll be doing graduate research on Harlequin starting next year at the University of Montana. So, Holly, thanks for coming over and sharing with us about this amazing uh, sea duck that comes to Montana every, every Sunday. Ladies and my name is Holly. Uh, I'm a wildlife technician in Glacier National Park. Um, this is my third season in the park, but second season working on birds. And um, this season, I am heading a um, pilot study. We're doing a big pilot study, which we'll talk about later, um, looking at non-invasive survey methods for harlequin ducks um, in the park and just trying to learn more about their demographics. But for this talk, I wanted to talk a little bit First, tell you about harlequins, tell you um, a little bit about their life history and some of the research that we've done in the past, and then we'll talk about the research that we're going to do into the future. Um, so yes, these are the harlequins. Um, they are very beautiful. Uh, the males, you can uh, distinguish them by their slate, uh, blue color, um, and their striking white, black, and chestnut markings. 
the females are brown, more discreet. Um, they're more discreet because they try to blend in with logs and rocks while they're um, incubating eggs, but the telltale kind of uh, symbol on them are these white spots, They're not necessarily distinguishing characteristic of the harlequin. Um, a couple other things, they're a long-lived duck, so some of the ducks can live over 18 to 20 years. Um, they also are late to mature, so they don't start reproducing until they're about three years old. Um, and they also only have about one clutch, or they only have one clutch a year. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about the harlequin. So, they're a sea duck. Um, they spend eight that, months. Is that too much? <laughs> 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 uh, so, yeah, they spend eight months or more of their life over on the coast. The harlequin range is. Um, here, so there's three, three different populations of harlequins in the world. There's two small populations over in the Atlantic, one off the coast of Greenland and Iceland, and then one off the coast of North America. And then there's one large population over here in the Pacific Ocean. And this is the population that we have here in the park. Um, our population that we have is typically, or is our population in Montana, I should say, um, typically ranges for their wintering ground from Northern California up to about Southern Alaska. Um, the ducks that we have here in Glacier, we know that most of them tend to winter off of the coast of Vancouver. Um, also, one thing that's interesting I think about their breeding range, or their, not breeding, their wintering ground, is this is where the ducks will um, pair in the winter long. And when they do pair, they pair for life. So they won't, they'll have the same partner year after year. Um, so some of the harlequin duck population estimates. So in the Northern Atlantic Ocean, there's only about 10,000 ducks that we, or that's the estimate. So the Greenland and Iceland populations are about three to 5,000 ducks. And then Eastern North America has less than a thousand, but in the Pacific Ocean, there's about 200 to 265,000 ducks. Um, in Asia, that there's just less than half of those ducks, with about 50 to 100,000. And in North America, we have 165,000 ducks. Um, there's different um, monitoring programs that go on in the lower 48, and also in Canada as well. And so we have some estimates of about how many pairs are come to each state. Um, so that's here, Washington, 275, Idaho, 70, Oregon, 50, Wyoming, 40, and then in Colorado, there used to be harlequins, but they have been extirpated from Colorado. But here in Montana, we have about 200 pairs that come in. Uh, in Glacier National Park alone, of those 200 pairs, we get about 40 of those pairs. So about 25% of the ducks in Montana are in Glacier. And something that's interesting is the McDonald drainage um, holds about 20 of those pairs. So half of the ducks in Glacier you can find on the one drainage. And how many of those ducks do you do already? This year? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> they're, they're here. They're back. Um, this is a map of Duck observations just from 2014 in Montana. So you can see that a lot of the ducks' observations are up here in Glacier. There's some done in the Custer Gallatin, um, and then some over here in more of the Kootenai area. Cool. Okay, so. so yeah, so let's talk about the harlequin ducks over when they're still over on their wintering grounds right before they come over. So this picture is actually taken of two harlequins um, off near the San Juan Islands, um, which is over on the Pacific. Um, so, come springtime, they start getting longer. This triggers the harlequins to start to fatten up, to start migrating. Um, so where do they go and what do they feed on in the spring? They migrate to herring spawning grounds. So there'll be tens of thousands of herrings that will come and lay 
thousands of eggs, each spare, sparing her herring, will lay over a thousand eggs, all in the same area, mostly in eelgrass habitats. Um, and this is a huge food source for not just harlequins, but other seabirds, other um, sea life that come and feed on these. Uh, this is a picture of just some of the herring eggs on some rockweed. And something that's kind of interesting about this photo is you can see this coloration change in the water. Down here, this is where the herring eggs and the sperm are changing the color of the water. That's how many herring are in this one area. So the herring come and they are around for about two weeks while they lay their eggs, and then the eggs take about two weeks to hatch. So in total, there is about a month period that this food source is very plentiful and very um, stocking for these birds. And then some other things that happen on the feeding ground is that this is where courtship and pairing the herds. So any birds that have not already been mated or paired, you'll oftentimes see up to a dozen males following one female. Um, <laughs> female. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> um, so the female, she's trying to select her male um, because she's going to mate with this male for life. And male selection is really important because the male, when she does migrate and starts breeding, the male is going to be her bodyguard and her lookout while she's fattening up in order to get healthy enough to incubate the eggs and then um, help raise the chicks until they're strong enough to survive. These feeding grounds, also, you can see tons of birds, as we've already shown, like this top photo, I thought it was well, both these photos, but just this top feeding ground, there's more ducks in one spot than all of Upper McDonald Creek. And down here, there's more ducks in one spot than all of Glacier National Park <laughs> in one spot. So, yeah, so they eat these eggs, that's their fuel for migration, and then they migrate. So something that's really interesting about these guys that's different than other bird species is they actually are an east to west migrator. They don't migrate north to south like many bird species do, but instead east to west. And they migrate to places like Upper McDonald Creek. This photo is of Upper McDonald Creek in May. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, survey <so> day. <laughs> really sunny summer vacation winter. Um, <laughs> no, but they come and they breed on pristine. Um, they come and they breed on pristine mountain streams. They are whitewater specialists. Actually, and having this characteristic is really unique to them because it allows them to access resources that many other species can't access because they're such strong swimmers and because they specialize in these fast moving, pristine mountain streams. Um, they're also one of the most strictly confined waterfowl, or more strictly confined to running water than any other waterfowl mm -hmm. in the northern hemisphere. Um, and this is true, like oftentimes when you are, if you're out looking for them, you might see them resting on a rock, but it'll be right on the shore. You won't find them in a parking lot, or you won't find them much farther from the creek. Um, and if they are flying up the creek, they don't ever really fly higher than about six feet above the creek as they're going up and down. Just like extra. Um, this is a video showing just the harlequins in 
white water and how mm-hmm. impressive of swimmers that these guys can be. Um, I one of those previous slides, did it say there were 40 pairs and 20 additional diapers? Yeah, and that one. Oh, in the picture? Yeah. I was going to say, not in the McDonald's, though. What do the, what do the bachelors do if they don't have a female? Um, if they don't have a female, oftentimes they'll still migrate back and just like feed and hang out. You'll see them hanging out. Yeah. It's <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Cool. So, we talked about what they eat on their feeding grounds before they migrate, but then when they're here, before they breed and while they're breeding, um, what they eat are aquatic invertebrates. So they eat, you know, caddis flies, um, stone flies, small fish, fish eggs, black flies when they're available. Um, and this is what they forage for. But I don't know if anyone in here is a fisherman. And the adult form of these aquatic invertebrates typically only last for a couple of days before they become ephemeral and are no longer in the water. So the birds will eat them when they are available, but most of the time they rely on these guys but in their larval form because their larval form lasts for two to five years and are always present in the stream. That's how long? Two to five years. Yeah, so they come, they feed, they get fat, and then the harlequin's mate. The females will begin incubation, and then the males will depart. The males then, they'll go to their molting ground, and then they'll go back to the wintering ground, where the females, once the chicks have been born, the females will go back and meet them on the wintering ground, back on the coast. So do the males go into an eclipse plumage, too, like a female-like plumage, without all the color? Because I've never seen them. Well, where so they look like female, I think they were female. But, <laughs> yeah, but. so the males will stay as the male coloration. Um, but when they're first born and until they're mature, they will look like females. They'll have the like brown coloration. So the, the males leave before the babies are born? They do, yes. So the males leave as soon as the females go to start incubating, which is why harlequin ducks don't have a second chance at a clutch. If their clutch is to fail, if these eggs were to fail for some reason, they cannot reproduce because, or try again, I should say, because the males are gone. So they, yeah. Um, and then something that is really cool is that we've started to learn about ducks through our research is that females pretty much only nest on the streams that they were born on. So they come back, they exhibit this really strong site fidelity coming back to the same stream. And I'm going to talk about how we know that in just a little bit, because it's really interesting. Uh, cool, can you spot the, the duck? Does it have a duck in this? <laughs> um, yeah, so here she is. So this is a female incubating her nest. Um, she, this is sort of her, their strategy as well. They will sit, they'll tuck their bills, and they will hide, essentially, hoping that predator just doesn't notice them and pass them by. Otherwise, they don't have really a flea or a fight defense while they're incubating. But they incu- but they nest in really like woody down areas. Um, so yeah, so the females start, then the males are like, cool, you guys got this. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> And then in about a month, these little fluff balls will emerge. So these guys, they're about three days old, um, super fluffy, little baby harlequin nets. Already in water. <laughs> yeah, three days and they're already in the water. Um, this is another video, but I'll just go by it. Um, cool. So I want to talk a little bit about the Upper McDonald Creek drainage, because that is where a huge population of harlequin ducks lives um, in the park. So this is, I should go back, this is Upper McDonald drainage and from, taken from Logan Pass looking up the drainage. It's a very pristine ecosystem. Um, and this is Upper 
Donald Creek uh, for about 10 miles of the creek and parallels to the going to the Sun Road, um, which makes it a very accessible creek to access um, to do surveys. And so we have been able to do quite a bit of research on this creek just because it is so accessible, unlike many streams in Glacier, but also Montana and their range in general. So like I said, it bolsters about 25% of all the chicks born in Montana are born on Upper McDonald Creek. It also has the highest density of chicks in the North America. But but even though Upper McDonald Creek and this drainage is doing really well, and we know a lot about these birds. Harlequins are considered a species of concern, which means that they're at risk due to declining population trends, threats to their habitats, restricted distribution, um, and or other factors. And so the reason, or some of the reasons why we are concerned about harlequins is we're starting to see population declines. So over off of the Strait of Georgia, this is where the ducks in Glacier, our ducks tend to go. This is near Vancouver. Um, we've noticed over the years a strong decline in populations. And not just there, but in our neighbors to the north, Banff has also recorded similar, similar declines. And we're interested in doing research to know what <coughs> does this species need to be successful on their breeding range. And that's where we, we come into play. Because even though they're only here for such a short time, it's a very important stage of their life. And so some of the reasons that there's some decline, there are decline that we think could be over harvesting um, in some parts of their range, harlequins are allowed to be hunted, uh, habitat loss, and that's either anthropogenic, so like deforestation, pollution, uh, people. This is over the Red Rocks area. If anyone, if y'all are familiar with the West Side. The going to the sun right it's a really popular swimming area but it's also a really popular area for harlequins um increase in bald eagles on their wintering grounds and then other predation um, and so yeah their their range is beginning to shrink um originally they used to come all the way down into colorado but they've been extricated from colorado and they also have been extricated from quite a few streams in Montana and, and Idaho that we know of. Um, and so it's a concern. So we're trying to learn more about them and learn how we can help them survive and bolster their populations. And we're interested in what drive, what's driving reproductive success. So here in Glacier, we do 10 surveys on Upper McDonald Creek every season. Four of them are uh, in the spring. We just did our last one today of our um, pair surveys, but then we do six brood surveys to try and get at the best, or the number of chicks each year. And so as you can see, they are pretty sporadic. So a lot of times their population numbers are pretty low. Our average number of chicks in the year coming off the creek is only about 10 chicks, um, and they only have a 7% success rate. So only 7% of chicks will actually fledge and fly off to their wintering grounds. But 7%, yeah. Um, and so every, typically most years are these pretty low numbers, but every few years, they tend to have a boom year uh, where they'll have big numbers, and these big numbers will help bolster their population. And this is what we've just learned from doing our surveys every year. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the research that we've done and how we know these things. Um, so back in the 70s, the research, researching harlequins and glaciers specifically started back in the 70s, where they would put colored leg bands on the birds. This is kind of similar to the loon project that the system science does, if anybody is familiar with that, where there's two different colored bands on each leg, and if you can identify the colored bands, that's like an identifier for the bird. 
But then in the 90s, they switched to using just one like tag that has a two digit code on it. So in this picture, it says G6, and every region was given different colors. So our region here in Montana are these blue ones. And so if you see a harlequin and you can see their leg, you might spot blue, uh, a blue leg band. And ideally, you can try and read the number with your binoculars. Um, of course, all the stars have to align in order to see it, but in theory, you can. <laughs> um, and then in 2000, and we still use these like tags today when we band the birds. And then starting in 2010, we started using more citizen scientists and volunteers to help uh, survey these birds and just get information about if you, where they're seeing them and getting reports from folks and starting to learn and really get numbers about folks. So a lot of people can volunteer and come help us with our brood surveys and they'll go out and we'll train you on our protocol and then they'll go out and help us collect data. And then in 2011, there was another grad student who was interested in what uh, helps nests be successful. And so they use temporary um, geolocators that would fall off after three months. So they were put on the ducks and after a few months they'd fall off. And he used this to learn about where they nest and then start to ask questions about why certain nests are successful and why certain nests are not. And then kind of the most recent big research project that we've done was they put these geolocators that were just these little guys on the legs. They just strapped right on the band of the bird and when they would migrate, these would record every day at sunrise and sunset. So we were able to learn more about like their year long migration versus just the three months that was done with the study that had been done earlier that year. But I want to talk a little bit too about why bands and like why banding. So since 2011, we've banded over 274 ducks in Glacier, um, 74 females, 80 males, and 120 chicks. Most of these have been banded between Upper McDonald Creek and uh, Lincoln Creek. And so the reasons for banding, some of the questions that we're starting to ask and that we're curious about are things like, how many ducks are in Upper McDonald Creek? Is Upper McDonald Creek actually as popular as we think, or is it just a staging area for ducks to then fly to other creeks? Um, site fidelity, mate fidelity, and dispersal. So some of the things we learned, also this is how we know that they're a long-lived duck and that they can live over 18 years. Um, because this guy, he was banded not as a chick, he was banded as an adult, and then in 2014, he was spotted again, and it was over 18 years after he had been originally banded. <clears throat> and then female dispersal. So this girl, she was banded here in Glacier as a chick. And then two years later, she was found again down in Yellowstone. But then the following year, when she was three years old, she was found back again in Glacier and had her own chicks back in Upper McDonald Creek. And we were able to learn that because of the bands, and because she has that unique identifying number, and it was spotted by just people out looking for them. Another kind of interesting fun story is there's not a lot of interchange between the different populations. Most of our ducks go uh, west, off to British Columbia, but every once in a while, one will end up over on the East Coast. And this is an example of when this guy was spotted off the coast of New York. And so he had traveled all the way from here, all the way over to New York, and joined this population over there. Um, so is that some adult on him? No, that's adult oh, okay. Yeah. But he, yeah, it's interesting because he's obviously in exception, not the rule, but it does happen, and we're able to learn about these things through banding efforts. And then what about telemetry? So like, why also do telemetry when we can learn so much from tags? So some of the questions with telemetry we were 
interested in learning about is where do they nest? Um, what sort of factors affect nesting and affect chick survival? So using telemetry, one of the really interesting things that we learned was that um, how important the lakes at the bottom of a lot of creeks actually are. Um, prior to this, we did not know that birds will come down to sleep on the lakes almost every single night, at least before they go into um, incubating and having the chicks. But while the males are still here, almost every night, the females and the males will fly back down to the creek and oftentimes fly up to 10 miles back up the creek every single day to forage during the day. But they like to breed or nest, not nest, roost on the creeks or on the lakes at the bottom of the creeks. <laughs> We were also able to locate 10 nests prior to this study. Only one nest had ever been found, and it, had, it was found on accident. Someone almost stepped on it. Um, but they then through this, they were able to find some nests and were able to learn where these guys nest. And they nest right next to the shore. This is the nest in this picture. And so it started to lead to questions about why some year are there no chicks and why are there other, mm -hmm. other years when there's a lot of chicks. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to ask questions about stream severity and does a year like this when we have a lot of snow, which leads to a really high runoff year, affect how the water looks. So if you've been here during high water, you might notice that the water is murky, it's darker, it's browner, but it makes it... Like, so you can't really see through the water, the turbidity is really high. Does that affect harlequins to be able to feed because they can't see their prey, they can't see the invertebrates? Does their, do their nests flood, flood out, especially having late runoff years when the females go to nest and there's a high water event? Um, and then asking questions about projecting into the future about water runoff. So this is uh, the runoff historically, but then with climate change, what is predicted for runoff and future, the next few years. And then also we could learn a little bit more about their migration as well. So we learned that that one duck went all the way to New York, but there's a lot of stops in between. So some of the things you can learn are these birds, they're banded over here. The yellow dots are the molting grounds. And so molting, for those of you who may not know, is where a bird will lose all of its feathers to regrow stronger new ones. And so some species, they do it um, in stages. So if you ever see a bird that looks pretty raggedy, it's missing some feathers, oftentimes it's just molting those. But then there's some species um, that will go to a specific location and lose all their feathers at once and then regrow them. And harlequins are one of those species. So through telemetry, we were able to start to learn, like, do they molt in the same places that they winter? And they don't. They, it, it's very close, but a lot of times they don't molt in the same location. And then you can learn about where they begin to winter. So that's kind of like the past history of our research that we've done and things that we've learned through these techniques. But Moving forward, I want to talk a little bit about what we have coming up the line. Because this is something that I'm really excited about. This is what my master's degree is going to be on. And um, I think it's really exciting. So we're, we're interested now in learning about non-invasive survey techniques because we've done banding, we've done telemetry. Um, but do we have to always handle the birds or can we learn about them without interfering with them and just learn about them with non-invasive survey methods. And so those are the, some of the questions that I'm looking at. And so this year we're doing a pilot study looking at three different survey techniques. The first is boots on the ground, which this is currently our only real way that we survey birds, is by physically walking up the creeks and looking for them. Um, but with that being said, there is some error in that because these birds are sensitive to disturbance and they are um, they can be pretty elusive and so if they notice you before you notice them then oftentimes you might miss them there's detectability issues 
And on Upper McDonald Creek, we're lucky because the, the road runs right next to it, but that's only one creek out of the 537 creeks in Glacier, you know? And so if you can only visit a creek one time and you don't see any ducks, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no ducks there, but to have, try and revisit it multiple times, <coughs> Isn't it, isn't it always plausible, especially when there's so many creeks? And that's just in Glacier alone. Think about, you know, the Badger and think about the rest of Montana and Idaho and British Columbia and Washington and the rest of their breeding range. So we're curious, is there a better survey method to survey ducks that's non-invasive? And so we're going to be looking at this summer environmental DNA, which is... Um, really exciting. We learned recently that the National Genomics Lab of Fish and Wildlife had acid, the uh, genome of the harlequin, which means that they had taken the, some DNA from a harlequin duck and figured out the sequencing. So if we can get harlequin DNA and they can match it, they can tell us if there was a duck there or not. And then camera traps, which... So what is eDNA? Like I said, it's environmental DNA, and what it is, is it's taking DNA samples from the environment. So you don't actually have to physically handle the bird. You take environmental, so in our case, we'll be taking water samples. And DNA is in any um, like matter, so saliva, poop, feathers, um, that comes off of a bird. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking water samples and seeing if we can detect birds, if there will be any of that DNA in the water samples that were collected. And yeah, this is super new technology. It's really exciting, but there's a lot of questions about it, right? That's why we're testing it, because can you pick up a bird, you know, a mile away, or do you have to be 100 meters from the bird? <laughs> Those are things we don't know. There's a lot of variables. And then we're also going to compare it to camera traps. So camera traps are remote cameras that you can put out, and they have different settings. So you can either do motion triggered, or you can do time-lapse, and we're going to test both motion and time-lapse because most of the time camera traps are used on mammals and not on running water. And so we're curious if it's like just going to get triggered by the water and the SD card is going to fill up really fast, or if it'll be able to detect it, or if knowing their behavior, a time-lapse would work. So if we took a photo every five minutes, say, will we still detect birds? And the reason why we think maybe this would work is knowing that their behavior is when they are on the creek during the day, they tend to hang out within a mile range where they'll fly upstream and they'll forage downstream for about a mile. And then they'll fly back upstream and forage downstream for a mile. And so knowing that they forage slowly downstream, we want to know, can we detect them with just a time lapse as well? Um, so last year, we put up a game camera uh, on a very still pool and got a couple photos. So we have some optimism that will work, but here's some Canada geese. Am I in prison? Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, here's some hard points they got in a photo. Um, yeah, so those are sort of the methods. And so this year what we're doing is we're testing methods because we're curious, is there a better way? And then in the next few years, we're hoping to take these non-medicine methods and apply them to creeks that we don't know if they're ducks to try and learn more about their distribution, their occupancy, their abundance, and ask some of those questions. And so it's really exciting research that we're beginning, but we're just in the beginning stages of this. Um, and none of this research and all of this information we know about Harlequins here, we can do it without our volunteers. Um, so thank you, everybody, for our volunteers. Um, the people who fund us, of course, the National Park Service, Federal Highways, UN, um, the Glacier National Park Conservancy, some more funders, um, and all of the partners and the support of everybody. So, 
Washington and British Columbia, um, along them, they don't breed on the coast themselves. They do always come in sh inland to breed on freshwater streams, but they don't. Oh, like like Montana's pretty far migration for that, but some of them will migrate closer. Yeah. Yeah. And did you say that forty percent of the males don't pair up? Yeah, it's about thirty-three percent more males than females. And do you know why? Why there are more males than females? They're just more males than females. <laughs> <laughs> so, like <But> cruel nature. Really over the females are really vulnerable when they're like raising eggs and things like that. They could yeah not survive that process pretty often. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. What are the, the most common natural uh, predators on harlequin bugs? Have you found any evidence of predation? Yeah, totally. So bald eagles are a huge predator. Um, and then also like mink and mm. like weasel otters. Yeah, otters. Mm. Um, yeah, they love to eat them. So they're huge. Yeah, they will as well. And that's an interesting question too is like, can we detect the DNA of predators as well? Mm -hmm. yes. So sometimes I think the word should go out. There should be a, a way to put out a public announcement to fishermen because I used to fish the two med all the time. Yeah. And I had no idea those were the days before I got involved with Audubon or anybody, mm -hmm. anybody else. And I used to push pens with chicks down down the two med all the time. And, okay. I did in badger too, but I mostly fished the two men. Yeah. And I had no idea that there, there, were, there was if there's anything significant about that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah, that's really good to think about. Like, how can we educate? Yeah, because I used to walk the creek, you know, I'd just walk up the creek mm -hmm. or down the creek. So I consistently pushed if I had a female with chicks. Yeah. I'd be consistently pushing her down the creek, and until I got to know some people in the Forest Service that were doing surveys on Lewis and Clark, mm -hmm. I didn't know that I should have been reporting it. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. On that note, is there any evidence that uh, human increase in visitation is having an effect on reproduction and survival? Right now, that's what we're trying to learn and trying to get at with these like non-invasive survey <coughs> methods because before with the banding it is pretty invasive to trap the ducks and handle them and does cause some stress to them and so we're trying to learn about that to try and learn like how much does anthropogenic disturbance affect these species because we do know just from observation that like in red rocks for example that is a super popular harlequin area before the road opens, you'll that's typically where you'll see most of the birds. You'll oftentimes see like five five there. Um, but then once it opens and becomes really popular swimming hole, they're gone. You can't see them, they get pushed back into like backwaters. Yeah, they'll go upstream backwaters all over. So yeah. There's a lot of hands. Okay. And then you and then or does your question continue? Oh, you know, yeah. Given the 30 years of data, of sighting data, and knowing that it's highly variable in some of the early years, we, uh, you know, there's a lot of this stuff. So those low numbers in the early 90s are probably underestimated. Totally. But we did document where they occurred. So could you use those data to look at location information relative to developed sites and the increase in activity on the stream? Yeah, totally. And that's actually a lot of the information. So this summer for the pilot study, one of the things I didn't mention was we're doing we're surveying creeks, ten creeks. Three of them are in Glacier, but the rest are not in Glacier. They're across Montana and in Idaho. And we're using data, historical data, to just to figure out what 
reaches of the rivers that we're going to survey. And so it's really good data to have and it's, it's useful. And that we're using it like moving forward as well. Cool. Okay. Do we know what led to their extirpation in Colorado? Hunting. Hunting. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Is anybody doing any work on how, on how to hypnotize ducks to maybe go to different areas? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> maybe that's, maybe you're on something. <laughs> Does the park actually have a, a management plan to, to protect the sections of, of McDonald Creek that they are prone to use and, and they're likely nesting areas? Yeah, they do. So that's part of the reason that Upper McDonald Creek is also no longer, people can't whitewater kayak or raft on it. Um, they shut that down and then there is, you can raft on it, but it's not as every mile because of what we know about their behavior of foraging within about a mile reach during the day. And then we're doing that in early July when we would expect to see uh, like single females. So we're, the reason why we're going to each stream twice is because of the boom bust cycle. So if this year happens to be a bust year and there's not very many chicks, we still wanna try and catch when there are ducks on the stream. So we're gonna go early when the single females maybe have not left yet, so there'd still be ducks on the creek. And then we're gonna revisit in three weeks later when we expect that the chicks have hatched and would be on the creek. And do the same thing, but then collect the cameras. And all your cameras on a creek, I'm, I'm assuming they're all, I guess the time-lapse cameras are taking photos at the same time yep. for one creek. Yeah, okay. exactly. So. Yeah. What are the three creeks in the park? Uh, uh, yeah, Upper McDonald Creek, Nyack Creek, and Waterton River. Okay. Yeah. What? Yeah. There's Nyack River. I'm real. I'm real. Yeah. Uh, a, you mentioned having a lake at the bottom of the stream. Is Nyack River a lake? Nyack does not. And so we don't, yeah. <laughs> but it's a really popular Harlequin Creek, actually. Yeah. Um, we have done surveys on that every year for the last five or six years, and every year it has quite a few Harlequins on that creek, um, which is really interesting because the Nyack, as far as creeks go, is pristine and is more wilderness. Um, not that many people get up into the Nyack drainage as compared to a McDonald Creek where there's a road that goes right along it, which is really interesting. <laughs> yeah, so the, the population of women bust, is that the same across the board universally or is that unique to that's pretty much across the board okay. universally yeah right and just the population decline as well is that the same in the atlantic yes. population okay. yeah yeah questions yeah yeah that's not bad i'm just i'm like musing on what you talked about with the natural history it seems like with the high chick mortality and the long lifespan then the adult population is maybe really driving the um, trends in like overall mm -hmm. success. And so with that, like you mentioned hunting um, being the driving force of expedition in Colorado. Is that the main pattern? Are there any other patterns in where these ducks are um, disappearing? Yeah, so extirpation <laughs> was huge in Colorado, but also habitat like alteration of humans is huge because they do exhibit that super strong site fidelity. And so from the banding that they've done, and not just the glacier, but they've banded all over their range, they've yet to document a bird not returning to its natal stream to breed. So when there's alterations to a stream, like a dam being built or like logging, stuff like that, it oftentimes like affects the stream. And then the the female may not find a new stream. They're like or, fish? Do they what? They're like fish? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So they might not, but that's also to say they could. We just don't know that yet. That's some areas that we still don't know. So, yeah. yeah. There used to be uh, annual migrations of eagles to the McDonald Creek drainage, yeah. and then they waned uh, when they lost the fish. 
do we have any evidence that the breeding success, the number of chicks has improved after the reduction in the number of, of eagles using the creek? Not really, because there's also just the annual variation and like stream runoff is different as just right. changing so drastically. Um, and so there, there are still eagles on the drainage that do hunt, but I'm not sure that there's much data showing that it affected the harlequin populations too much. Yeah. The harm, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll do you and then you. Okay. Did the harlequin population hang out in the, in the lower um, McDonald's Lake, um, south of the, of the lake? Yeah, they do. Um, not to the same extent, um, but you will see some down there. People down there. Yeah, yeah, but you will see some down there. Okay, great. So it's just average, what, what time uh, do the ducks get here? And what time do the males leave and when the females leave? Totally. Um, so the ducks start to arrive at the end of April, beginning of May. And then the males are only here for about a month, so they'll begin to leave soon, like end of May, early June. And then the females will incubate pretty much the whole month of June. And then July is when you would expect to start seeing single females and like the really, really little chicks in July and August is when you would see like the females with their chicks. And then in the like yeah, end of August is when the females and the chicks migrate out. Yeah. Yeah. Practical question. So you, I, you had a lot of funders there and stuff, but for what you want to accomplish, mm -hmm. um, are you adequately funded at this point? We are working on funding still. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm just curious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is. We we're funded for this summer. This pilot year has been funded. We're, um, it's actually been a huge, I, yeah, I can't express how mm -hmm. like grateful I am for this summer because this project um, has a lot of support from not just the park, but from the Forest Service, from Montana FWP, Idaho Fish and Game, and the Montana Natural Heritage Foundation. So everyone's been pulling together funds for this pilot study this year and resources and whatnot to like make it happen. So this year we're good, we're like well funded, but the next two years we're still working on those funding. So Yes. And you said that there are a species of concern. So are there any protections that are being put in place to help protect the population? Yeah, so for unfortunately species of concern is it's like a state and region wide. It's not a federal protection. So there are some protect it's not like quite as if it were listed under like the Endangered Species Act as threatened or endangered. Um but it does put some regulations on like hunting and the ability to help with habitat protection, like not allowing kayakers to flush them down the creeks and things like that. But um, it's not a very strong protection, unfortunately. Is there a tipping point, do you think, where they could become an endangered species or listed? I think there is. Um, where that tipping point is, I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? We definitely take a few more before. I had a, I had a thought about um, you mentioned bald eagles being heavy predators, um, and a lot of their wintering grounds look like they're on like what we like salmon run areas. Mm -hmm. There's like the health of salmon run, or like I know like the whole herring row. Like in terms of like indigenous peoples and stuff, like they've been farming herring row in those areas forever, and that's mm -hmm. like collapsing. Like so, that's that's like a that's a pressure. I guess that's two, two questions at the point. But that's a, that's a pressure on them. And like, if there's less salmon, there's you know a bald eagle pressure on them too. Yeah, totally. And that's one of the their biggest um, like threats is the increase of bald eagles on their wintering grounds. Um, the eagles are increasing. The eagles are increasing on their breeding grounds. All the pressure is increasing. Yeah. So that is yeah really interesting. I hadn't thought about. Mm. Those combinations. Yeah. Do the other birds get that row? Yeah, definitely. So it's like a super yeah. popular feeding ground for all sorts of other seabirds and sea life, like other fish people. and people. And yeah, just a huge, a huge resource. 
forgive me if you already mentioned, but what do you know what the mortality in the park looks like? The mortality in the park? Yeah, like if, if we have any harpins die in the park, where they die in there. Oh, um, mostly predation. By um, yeah, by eagles, mink. Um, so especially with the chicks, because when the chicks mm-hmm. aren't strong enough and big enough to fly, they're pretty easy target to just pick off. Um, Awesome. Well, well, I got uh, one more question for you. Yes. So, how can folks who are just out and about, um, you know, what can they do to help uh, with a better understanding of harlequins and their distribution or other information, like the way people report sightings or other things that would be helpful to managers and researchers? Totally. Yeah. So, if you're ever out and you have binoculars and notice that the bird is banded. Um, trying to get a look at the number on the band is super helpful. Um, there is a program called WARF, which I am going to give you. I was emailing. Um, called, that's the Wildlife Observation Resource Form that is very helpful, where you can um, like give us wildlife observations, not just of harlequins, but of any species. Um, and then also, I would be happy to give my email and my supervisor, Lisa Bates. She's like the mastermind behind all of this. She's been working at Harley Quinn's for a couple of decades. Um, and she's really the person that would like to know that information. So like getting that to them. Um, but then also if you're not in Glacier and you're out in the Florida service, um, that's also good information. You could give it to me or Lisa because we're working on this huge project with Forest Service, with FWP, with all of the people who are interested in this project. And it's not just the bird number, right? It's also like creek locations. Totally, yeah. Creek locations, like what creek you're on, some defining characteristic would be great, like river mile or trail trail or anything like that. All of that's really important information to know. Um, you can also look up and figure out if there's like a forest service um, office, that would be a good person to report that information to as well. Yeah. Are you one of these people? <laughs> <laughs> this is her background. <laughs> uh, it's it's Lou and Bill. Well, Holly, I really want to thank you for coming and sharing with us your uh, hard harder knowledge and expertise about harlequin ducks. It's really an amazing, amazing species, and that's pretty cool. I saw them once on the ocean, I know, but it was in the Vancouver area, so I wonder if I've seen ducks have gone back and forth, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. And as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to offer you either a sweatshirt or a oh. t-shirt or other piece of awesome. GTMA wear that we have at the back table. Mm-hmm. You can pick out a color and size that's appropriate. Awesome. Really, it's really cool so for you doing that. And um, as we wrap up here, folks, we have